Hello? Another aspect of metagenomics that really hasn't been mentioned, I don't know if this is the panel to answer this, but it can be used to go fishing in, uh, you know, nasal pharyngeal swabs to find all kinds of novel bugs, including, I'm giving a, an example just uh, hypothetical, you know, something that was isolated from a hot spring in Yellowstone or the bottom of the ocean or, you know, you find all these crazy organisms in bovine noses. Uh, um, how do we sort out all that, all these pathogens? We've all only talked about four or five pathogens. What about all the ones we don't know about? That will be one of the interesting endeavors initially is just get an idea of how much variation there is across how much you, what you normally see across populations of animals, how much variation there is in that, um, how often you do you see these low abundance organisms. You know, it's, it's likely that the culture-based methods have picked up most of the important players, but there still could be one in there that you don't know about, an unknown that keeps showing up over and over and over again. Um, you know, there's, uh, to some degree, examples of that um, in uh, human uh, cystic fibrosis, where other organisms have been, been identified, some through culture, but also some through metagenomic sequencing. So it, this is a matter of rolling up your sleeves and getting, getting into doing it. But I can't, I can't uh, underscore the importance of designing your studies properly. That's the really critical part to doing it. Otherwise, it's just data. And there's a lot of data out there that's not very useful. Uh, Dr. Brumbaugh, you create, or presented some really interesting new directions that, that science could go and maybe should go. The thing that discourages me is every time Mike Appley reports to us back from his interactions with decision makers, it seems to be that science doesn't matter, that it's the emotion, the perception, et cetera, that is driving that truck. So I'm, I'm wondering about the, the place, the relevance of science anymore, and, and the, or, or maybe scientists should be more emotional and create more perceptions. Maybe that's the way to, to get our points across. So I, I'm looking for balance there or, or insights into the future role of science. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It, it doesn't take much regulation to squelch good science. And that doesn't always, um, they don't always go together. I don't have the answer either. I, if, if I influenced change, it would have happened a long time ago. And um, I, I still go down swinging. Uh, I'd rather be on the side of good science than uh, emotional politics. Maybe one of the things we need is better advertisement. Maybe that'd be the better way to do it, get a good marketing campaign that uh, could handle that. But I haven't seen much of that show up in the literature either. Gordon, I want to ask you a question, and, and I plant this seed in every audience I get an opportunity with, and this is a really good one, because the, the thing I never hear in the antimicrobial talks and the drug resistance talks is um, what's the impact of the use of antimicrobials on um, genome evolution? And when you hear that first, you, you look at me and say, why on earth would he ask that? But the, the most rapid and efficient way that new pathogens emerge is by mixing around existing genes. So if you look at these diarrheogenic E. coli, they move very quickly and they move by rearranging genes that have already, um, that have already evolved and emerged. And if you look at antimicrobial resistance, most of the, the well-known, well-studied resistance markers, they're always associated with mobile genetic elements. So there may, be, may be actually be, be an indirect effect of selection on accelerating the rate of genome evolution. And that's a real question. I, I put on the, nobody has the answer to that. It's gonna take a massive study to get at it, but I think it's, a, it's another outcome that needs to be measured. So I like to plant that seed whenever I get the chance. Somebody may do it someday. Yeah, I can readily answer. I have no idea, but. <laughs> Uh, the thing that uh, along that line is that when people go looking for resistance genes in the environment, they're so surprised when they find it. I heard a deal just uh, earlier this week or over the weekend that 
they found some resistance gene from a sample that they found offshore somewhere in the ocean. And they were just absolutely enamored. How in the world could that gene have gotten so far from people? Study pharmacology. Where do our drugs come from? They come from the environment. If something survives in the environment, it's got to become resistant to something. And the mold that started the group of drugs that we know of cephalosporins came from a cesspool, the effluent from a septic system off the shore of Sardinia in the Mediterranean islands or Mediterranean Sea. They're out there. It shouldn't be a surprise. Yes, they're sharing genes because they got to live with each other and somebody's got to survive. How they do it, I don't know, and what influence, I don't know, but I agree that that's a subject to look into. This is a more practical question for Dr. Benson. So I've been pretty intrigued with the possibility of using metagenomics to characterize respiratory pathogens. Um, but the samples that you collect from the respiratory tract are pretty different than colon contents. And my friends who are geneticists say, boy, the big problem is all the host genome material in there. Yeah. What's the prospect for sorting that out, do you think? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. We, we haven't played as much with, with the nasopharyngeal swabs. We just did a few of those, and that was 16S at the time. But I can tell you, uh, we've done a lot of other things, and one of those being food matrices, and those are some of the nastiest to get DNA out of. And if, if you're in muscle tissues or anything like that, you have to resort to some crazy methods to try and get rid of host DNA because with full metagenome, it's just eating up your sequencing space. Um, so we've gone back to density gradients. I mean, we're doing old-fashioned stuff, but they work. Um, and so you just have to get really creative about that. But, yes, it, it's a huge problem. Comment. I just want to comment on the, where the, the antibiotic resistance genes come from and why are people surprised when they find them in these weird places. And it, it is true. You, you know, a lot of antibiotics are made by microbes. Tenomycetes are bacteria that are known for making, um, making antibiotic, antibiotics. And tenomycetes have been around for a billion years. They evolved about a billion years ago. And so, uh, and microbials, antibiotics have been around probably for about a billion years. So uh, they're, they're there. They've been out there for, for a long time. It's just a question of how frequent are they in the environment that you are, you're looking at. And uh, I don't know. I just always get a little bit uh, surprised by, by that. And, and I just want to put that in context. Antibiotic resistance has probably been around for about a billion years because the microbes that are, have been making them have been around for about a billion years. Yeah, and I, in thinking about that, you know, it's true, but I hate to see the argument that resistance has always been here is saying that any pressure we apply today is okay, because it's not. And if you look at fluoroquinolones, that's not something that came from the natural environment. That's something that we created, and now we see, and we can argue about the application of breakpoints, et cetera, but, uh, you know, the, the fluoroquinolones pharmacodynamics are ones that actually were developed in vivo human ventilator associated dependent patients and on through other places but uh, you know Gordon I guess I'm curious or so is resistance a myth and we should just go on doing everything the way we are and it's a myth that's made up and I, I just I saw two messages during your talk and I'm just curious where we are no it's real I made no comment to, to the contrary okay I mean I so when we look at it, it just seemed like, okay, all right, well, then we're on the same page. I think it is real. And the, the in vitro testing is an indicator variable. I mean, it's, and it's imperfect. Um, I happen to believe that when we have isolates that show up as resistant to uh, an organ or a drug that we're using in uh, respiratory disease, I'm pretty confident from serving on the CLSI committee that I think there's a good chance that we're taking the drug out of the out of the mix. And 
you know, when you go, and it is very true that at any MIC, you're going to have a mix of successes and failures. We'll find resistant isolates in ones that are, that are uh, responders to treatment, and we'll find susceptible isolates at the dead pile, and it's about populations and distribution of responses within those populations. And I couldn't agree more that to find an S or an R in an individual animal is not an absolute predictor of the treatment outcome in that animal. But when we look at populations with those types, I think, I think that's where it starts to come in. Brett, got time for one more question, if there is one. And um, can I can I ask it? You bet, Dr. Sprouls. How many times do you have samples submitted asking for culture susceptibility in a virulence panel? In the virulence panel, uh, susceptibility is is frequent virulence panel. No, I'd like to think so, and and that the. The molecular testing that we're doing now, I think, will hopefully in the next five, six, seven years, we will be able to routinely, that's my, my hope, uh, that we'll be able to routinely give some idea of how virulent that organism is. One of the comments I made about wrecks, if we have viruses in there that are virulent, then probably we're going to see a real wreck. If those are just viruses that are as benign uh, as far as uh, producing disease is concerned, uh, like you would expect out of a, a vaccine, then we're probably not going to have a wreck. Well, I think we'll take our break. I just want to personally, um, I, guess, I don't see Dr. Chase in here, but all you guys on the committee, I'm, I see a lot of you guys. I think this has just been, for those of us out in practice, we've spent a lot more time at the nucleotide level than, than we're all used to, but I'm just thoroughly convinced that sometime when I have a few more gray hairs, we're going to get this thing figured out, but it's probably going to be a combination of Dr. Benson at the A's and the T's and Dr. Tom in, you know, out in the feed yard. So... It's exciting times, so I just want to um, thank all you speakers personally. Thank you, organizers. Um, and I think we break for for lunch, and I don't know when we'll go back. The cowbell will ring, I guess. So thank you. Let's give our speakers one more round of applause. <laughs>